Okay, I think the number of participants uh, is stabilized, so we may uh, start. Uh, so, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, let me start our next scientific seminar. Uh, first, that we'd like to announce uh, that uh, next week, at the same time, we will have a talk from Alexei Melnikov. He is from Valiev Institute of Physics and Technology in Moscow and also from University of Basel. And he will tell us about uh, machine learning for setting up quantum experiments, particularly uh, for three photon entangled states generation and quantum walks. Okay. Uh, and now we have a talk uh, considering to our BRICS project and uh, Professor uh, Xiao Son Ma uh, from Nanjing University will tell us about uh, harnessing single photons in quantum technology, please. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, give you an overview and some recent updates uh, of our uh, group's work. Uh, specifically uh, on the photonic quantum technology. So uh, I will take the uh, same format as uh, Paolo did last week. So before I Your voice is bro broken, so I think. To the academic part, I would like to give you all a, a short introduction on the university. Okay. Is it okay? Um, hmm. Interesting. Is it okay? It's better. It's better? Yeah, now it's better. Okay, I don't know what happened. So that's me. I think, I think if you will uh, talk uh, slowly, it may be better. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, uh, let's, give a, let's give another try and uh, feel free to interrupt me when you cannot hear me clearly. Okay? Okay. Yes. So, um, okay. So um, this is a map of China and uh, this is a, a metropolitan Shanghai in, in China and Nanjing is somewhere here. It's about uh, 300 kilometers away from Shanghai and it's the capital of Jiangsu province. All in all, we have about 9 million inhabitants. Um, by the Chinese standard, it's not a super sized city, but it's already uh, quite big. And uh, the, uh, the area is about 7,000 kilometers. And Nanjing is uh, not only uh, an important city in the modern China, but also it's an important city in ancient China. So Nanjing has been uh, six capital, uh, been capitals for six dynast dynasties. And in the city, we have a full of uh, ancient uh, uh, buildings and structures. And uh, the university I'm working in, now it's called uh, Nanjing University. And it's also one of the oldest university in China and founded in 1902. So you can see the, the developments of uh, Nanjing University from uh, old days uh, now. And uh, uh, starting from uh, 10 years ago, we uh, established a new campus, uh, which is called uh, Xianling Campus. And just to give you a number, um, so all in all, we have uh, uh, 33,000 uh, students and uh, it's about uh, 13,000 uh, undergraduates and uh, 15 to 16,000 uh, master and uh, doctor students. And we ha also have a fairly large portion of international students. And for, from faculty uh, side, we have 2,000 faculty members. And among, among them, we have almost 1,000 professor, full professors. And uh, Nanjing University is, uh, um, is a, a university with very uh, uh, different disciplinaries. Uh, we have uh, 28 schools. That's like a larger scale uh, comparing to departments. And we have uh, 87 different undergraduate programs, et cetera. So for physics, uh, so Nanjing the Department of Physics in Nanjing University is one of the oldest uh, physics departments 
and uh, it is among the finest uh, physics departments now in China. So we established the uh, physics departments in 1915. And uh, so in 2015, we celebrate the 100 year uh, celebration of uh, physics departments uh, at Nanjing University. Uh, and in our university, we have uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, people, including faculty members and employees. All in all, we have 200 also uh, people, and uh, we have 10 uh, academicians of Chinese Academy of Sciences and uh, several uh, uh, very prestigious award uh, or D uh, in our department. And research-wise, Nanjing University is uh, uh, famous for the condensed matter physics, especially on the uh, on the theory, but on both theory and experiment parts. And also, we have a, a AMO se uh, section and quantum information, acoustics, particle physics, and so on. So it's fair to say that we have a broad range of coverage in uh, modern physics. Okay, so that's uh, a short introduction about Nanjing and my university and also the department I'm working in now. So let's go uh, back to the physics. And today I'm going to tell you about some recent developments in my group on photonic quantum technology. So the contents of my talk uh, can be separated into two parts. The first one is uh, uh, we talk about photonics from the fundamental perspective. And I will introduce you one of our recent work on realizing quantum wave particle superposition in a delayed choice experiment. It's the first part. The second part is from the application perspective. And so uh, recently we have used a uh, silicon photonic chip to realize uh, a three dimensional quantum entanglement. And with this, entanglements, we uh, realize a series of application in QIP. For instance, we do quantum simulation and also we uh, did uh, uh, quantum metrology with this uh, type of uh, platform. So the first part is about fundamental physics and uh, this is a wave particle superposition in a delayed choice experiment. And this work has been done by uh, two uh, of my students, Kai and Qian, Kai is a second year uh, graduate and Qian is an uh, undergraduate, the fourth year undergraduate student. So um, let's go back to quantum physics 101. So when we talk about quantum system, we uh, one of the few um, terms pop up would be, for example, wave particle duality, entanglement, etc. And if we look at the wave particle duality, we can illustrate this bizarre phenomena of the single photon with a, such a, a salt experiment, or in German, it can be called the Duncan experiment. So imagine if you have a simple interferometry and you inject single photons into this interferometer by changing the phase shift of one of the paths and measure the output single photon counts, you will obtain such a figure. From D1, you will see a sinusoidal oscillation from D2, you will also see a complement uh, sinusoidal uh, modulation. And this is a signature that the photon propagates from both passes. And this shows the wave behavior of these single photons. Okay, nothing special, similar to the, similar to the classical waves. However, if you make a slight change of the experiment by removing the second beam splitter, so if you can see, um, Oh, by the way, can you see my uh, laser pointer on the screen? Yes. Okay, good. So if you remove the second beam splitter in the experiment and do the exact the same measurement, namely by tuning the phase, measure the photon counts, what you will get is a flat curve. And this curve, meaning the counts are constant, it's independent of the phase. So the, by, show, by observing this, you can uh, conclude that the photon only propagating one of the two passes, not both. Furthermore, if you measure the anti-correlation, meaning if you measure the coincidence between D1 and D2, you will get a coincidence count equal to zero. Why? Because this is a typical behavior of these single photons. A particle cannot split 
on the first beam splitter. So with these experiments, which just modified a little bit from the up one by removing the second beam splitter, we are investigating a totally different behavior of this single photon. That's the particle behavior of this single photon. Then if we uh, uh, further uh, use, uh, the, for example, the quantum state to describe uh, this behavior of single photons uh, operationally, we can write down the wave state of this single photon, namely the amplitude of photon taking pass zero or phase taking pass one depends on the phase you apply it. On the other hand, you can also write down the particle states, which is just zero plus some uh, ampli uh, phase uh, and, and one state. So the amplitude of these two uh, bases does not depend on the phase. The amplitude of these two basis state does not depending on the relative phase in the interferometer. Then you might ask, so if you um, coming from a classical uh, physics point of view, then you will ask that how come it's, um, we will get such a, a strange conclusion. Although we use the same single photon input, same beam splitter, and we obtain two contradictory pictures. And we all know as we educate uh, and learn quantum physics, this is a typical um, behavior for complementarity as uh, Bohr uh, proposed or uh, interpreted uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics. However, not everyone is happy about this situation or not everyone is happy about this interpretation. Um, and John Wheeler um, in the late 70s to the beginning of 80s, he illustrates the complementarity with, uh, uh, with a very uh, striking examples. And this example is called Wheeler's delayed choice experiment. So he first concretely proposed this experiment in his book, Quantum Theory and the Measurement, edited by Wheeler and Turek. So in his uh, proposal, he suggests, how about we send a single photon into this Maxinda interferometer and only one, only now we do one more trick. Namely, we can decide whether we insert or remove the second beam splitter after the photon entering into, into this interferometer. So this gives us two possibilities. Again, the first possibility is uh, measure the which way information and hence the particle behavior. And in second, we measure the interference and hence this is the wave behavior. So this is what uh, Wheeler called delayed the choice. So we delay the choice after photon entering into the interferometer. Why we want to do this? We want to exclude the possibility that the photon know the settings of the, of the interferometer and behave accordingly. By doing so, photon can reproduce what quantum mechanics predicts. So this, uh, although this is a, a thought experiment proposed in late 70s and 80s, but uh, strikingly, I mean, the first conclusive experiment was done in 2007 in Alan Aspect and Philip Granger and Rock School. So in these experiments, which I term coined it as a classical delay choice experiment. So I will explain you in a minute why I call it classical delay choice experiment. So in these experiments, the experimentalists managed to space-like separate the photon entry into the interferometer with respect to the random choice of inserting or removing the second beam splitter at the remote location. So this is a beautiful experiment reported in 2007. And why I call it classical delay choice experiment? Because in this experiment, the experimentalist can only probe the single photon properties being a wave or being a particle. So this is a wave or particle. You can never pro probe the wave and particle uh, behavior in one single experiment. So this is uh, what has been shown in 2007. 
And uh, if we take the, uh, the, uh, the framework we talked about just now, by having this particle state or wave state, we can know in this experiment, one can only probe the mixed state of particle and wave. There is no coherence between these two states whatsoever. Okay, so this is the first part. So the second part uh, is called quantum delay choice experiment. And this, is, uh, this was first proposed by Terno and his colleague in 2011. Um, in this proposal, they suggest to replace this classical control, this random number generator with the quantum bit. And this quantum bit can be in a simple position state, namely zero plus one. By having such a quantum control, one can probe the coherent superposition between wave and particle. So this means we can have a beam splitter which is in and out. And in the above example, in the classical case, you can only set the beam splitter in or out. So that's a key difference. However, uh, okay, so after this proposal, there, there has there have been a, a wide range of uh, uh, experimental demonstration. Um, in this experiment, or in most of these experiments, one key in ingredient is a two qubit quantum gate. So here one needs to use this control qubit to control the settings of the beam splitter. And this is a two qubit quantum gate. And in all of these demonstrations, this two qubit gate is a quant uh, is a local uh, two qubit quantum gate. And then we will have a, one more question. So if we want to combine what has been shown in classical delay choice experiment, namely that one can space-like separation between two uh, rel relevant events, namely the choice and the entry. However, here it's difficult because you need a local two qubit quantum gate. How to solve this problem? Ah, sorry. <laughs> so uh, before I go to the uh, solution of this problem, I would like to mention that uh, uh, this uh, concept of quantum delay choice experiment is also closely related to the uh, concept of quantum eraser, which was originally proposed by Scully, Anglet, and Walter. And later on, this experiment was demonstrated uh, by uh, Kim, uh, Sergey, and uh, uh, Xi's group. And this is, uh, of course, this is one of the uh, milestone experiments in quantum optics. And okay, let's come to how we solve this problem. Um, and um, before we come to the solution, we will have some pose some questions. The first question is, how can we close the locality loopholes in this experiment? Namely, how can we uh, space-like separate the two, uh, two qubit quantum gate with respect to the interferometry. So that's the first question. The second question is how to demonstrate the coherence between particle state and wave state, right? Because we claim that we have a quantum version of this delay choice experiment. One key aspect is to show the superposition states between particle and wave. And this superposition meaning that we want to create such a state and this state is composed by particle state and wave state. And we, we want to show explicitly this state depends on the phase of, uh, of, uh, of this so-called small delta. And the solution for this question or, or for these two questions are the following. So first we need a multi-photon entanglement. And second, we need a non-local preparation of a two qubit quantum gate. So we need a non-local two qubit gate and a multi-photon entanglement. And this is uh, 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 the scheme of our uh, experiment. So first of all, we cannot uh, do this single uh, qubit experiment or single photon experiment. We need more photons. And in our experiment, we have in, uh, three photons, namely the system photon. And system photon is a photon we are uh, of interest. We want to investigate the wave and particle properties of this system photon. The second photon is control photon. This control photon will control the quantum beam splitter, so to say. And the third photon is ancillary photon. 
And in our experiments, we need to have uh, entangle, entanglement between control photon and ancillary photon. And I will explain why we need that in a moment. So this is our, our if we break down or simplify our experiments, this is our scheme. And we did this experiment in Nanjing, in Nanjing University. And this is uh, one of the buildings uh, in our university. And this is uh, in Gulo campus. And we distribute our experiment in uh, between two labs. The first one is lab one and second one is lab two. And they are separated by 141 meters. And in lab one, we prepare this multi-photon entangled states, namely this three-photon entangled states. And, uh, and also we prepare this uh, interferometry for system photon. And in lab two, we implement this local, uh, local unitary transformation for the ancillary photon. And we guide the ancillary photon from lab one via optical fiber to lab two. So this is our uh, schematics of our experiments. We have a TICEF uh, femtosecond laser, which is a standard uh, laser system to create a multi-photon entanglement. We pump uh, uh, nonlinear crystals with this laser and generate polarization entangled photons between photon A and photon C. So photon A and photon C are polarization entangled as we term here as an EPR source. And then we uh, propagate this blue uh, pump onto the second crystal. And there we generate another pair of uh, correlated photons, namely photon S and photon T. Photon T has been a trigger photon and we herald the existence of system photon by detect the trigger photon. And then we send photon S into photon S and photon C into these long fiber loops. And then we guide them onto this Maxinda interferometer. And here we use polarization as our encoding. Therefore, a two pass Maxinda interferometer can be realized by this polarization version of this interferometry. And to adjust the, uh, the phase, the relative phase of this interferometer, we use this uh, uh, SP, uh, so it's a, a Soleil Barbinet compensator. And this phase is uh, represented by the uh, small phi here. And now we come to the important part. So the second beam splitter, so here we need the quantum beam splitter, right? As I just mentioned. So we realize this second switchable beam splitter with a control hardmark gate. And this is, uh, uh, we uh, use the design of this control Z gate and put uh, wave plates before and offset to translate the control Z gate into a control hardmark gate. And in this hardmark gate, we need photon C and photon S to have a, a, the so-called Hongo Mando interference on this partial polarizing beam split. And by detecting a coincidence counts after these two, uh, after these gates with these two detectors, we can uh, witness a successful operation of this control hardmark gate. So this is in lab one. And in lab two, we guide the photon A via this single mode fiber and send it to lab two, which is 141 meter away. And in this lab, we uh, implement a fast and active switching uh, of polarization by using these electro-optical modulators. And here we can, uh, uh, we use this to realize the polarization rotation of this ancillary photon. And therefore, by projecting the ancillary photon to specific polarization state, we can remotely prepare this two qubit quantum controlled hardmark gate. And okay, so here are some, some details. So we use type two uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion for the source and also, um, and here we use uh, uh, not only optical fiber to connect these two labs, also we use coaxial cable to connect uh, these two labs in order to transmit data back and forth. 
And uh, so here I would like to draw your attention that we have three important parameters to vary. The first one is the phase of the interferometer, which is implemented by this solid barbinate compensator here. So this is a small phi. And second one is this delta. This delta is implemented by the uh, wave plates and this delta will introduce a phase in this maximally entangled state between photon A and photon C. The third parameter, which is also important, is this alpha. Alpha stands for the polarization projection angle of this ancillary photon in lab two. So uh, from now on, I will concentrate on these three parameters and show you uh, our uh, results in a few minutes. So before I show you the uh, results, you may ask, why do you want to uh, separate this apparatus into two labs? And the reason is we want to have a conclusive demonstration uh, of this experiment. Namely, we want to make the interference events. So here is a space-time diagram. The x-axis is the space in the unit of meters, and the y-axis is, is time in the unit of nanoseconds. So what we would like to achieve is to have a space-like separation between interference events, as shown here with the green dots, with respect to the uh, choice event, namely how we make the choice here in lab two. In order to realize that, we need to have a space separation. And uh, as I explained, that for photon S and photon C, everything is local in lab one, but we introduce a long fiber delay here. And therefore, from the space-time diagram, you will see photon S and photon C, they stay at lab one, but they will uh, propagate along the time axis. So this is the interference event. On the other hand, since we distributed photon A, from lab one to lab two. And this photon A will, uh, will propagate not, along, not only along time, but also along space. And this is how the uh, photon A propagates on this space-time diagram. So important thing is we need to make sure that event I and for example, event F, they have to be outside of the light cone from each other. So you can see this is a future light cone of event F and uh, event I is outside of these events. So from spatial relativity perspective, photon F cannot influence photon I in, with, a, with a signal traveling equal or smaller to the speed of light. So with this, we ensure the so-called Einstein's locality condition. And here is some introductions uh, of different events. For example, events G, which is sitting at the origin, it's uh, uh, generation events. So at the, uh, with, at the origin, we generate all three photons. As CA, they are traveling. And lab one, lab two, lab one, we do the interference. And lab two, we have uh, several, uh, several events happening related to the random choice and the polarization projection and, and so on. So with this cur uh, uh, diagram, I uh, wish that I convince you that uh, by having this configuration, we can space-like separate I with respect to F. So here is uh, our data. So as we can um, engineer our source and make, it, uh, make the source to generate the state as we wish, uh, so first thing, we look at the classical mixture. So if we have a particle state and a wave state, they are in a mixed state. And uh, then you measure the uh, probability amplitude of the photon coming out from the interferometer. You will obtain such a curve. So x-axis is alpha. Alpha stands for the polarization projection of the ancillary photon. Y-axis is phi. This stands for the phase of the interferometer. As you can uh, clearly see, that's when we choose alpha equal to pi over two. So when you choose alpha equal to pi over two, we 
sets uh, particle behavior to be zero, right? This is cosine alpha. We only look at the wave behavior of the uh, of the photon. So sine alpha equals to one. And if you make a vertical cut in this 2D plot, you will find this behave as it should. It's a sinusoidal, uh, it's a sinusoidal oscillation. On the other hand, if you set alpha to be zero, meaning that you only look at the particle behavior of this single photon, you will make, then if you make a cut, you will see the probability is independent from the interferometer phase as it should, like a particle. So, so far so good. This uh, is something we expect from standard uh, experiments. And uh, the figure B is a calculation based on our uh, experimental setup. So the behavior is similar, uh, except that the visibility dropped is instead of one is 0 0.86. And C is what we measured. So we reconstruct this probability and we measure it's pretty in a reasonable uh, uh, resemblance to the theory plot. However, this is a classical state. What we really care is the quantum state, right? So if we make a superposition between particle and a wave, then we do the calculation, we will find the behavior is strikingly different from what we get in the classical mixture case. And here, uh, so at uh, alpha equals two pi over two, it's still a sinusoidal. At alpha equal to zero, it's still a, a flat curve at constant, but what is different is in the middle. So the evolution between particle to wave is strikingly different comparing to the classical case. This is because of the coherence. So just to uh, remind you again, so this, this is what I have just shown you in the last slide. This is classical case, this is quantum case. And obviously in the transition peer, uh, uh, regime, they behave very differently. And again, by taking into account the imperfections, we calculate what we should get. And this is the calculation. And in F is what we measured experimentally. So those are in close uh, uh, similarities. However, this is not the end of the story. Why? Because we want to show, or we want to show a direct proof of coherence. Namely, not only care about alpha or phi, we also want to show a direct dependence of this probability outcome as a function of delta. And this delta stands for the phase between particle states and wave states. So this delta phase dependence is a key, uh, uh, um, key point we want to uh, prove. Again, we compare the classical and quantum case. In the classical case, here we plot x-axis is the interferometry phase, this phi. And the y-axis is this delta. This delta stands for the phase between particle and wave. As one can imagine in the classical case, independent from the uh, small phi, when you make the vertical cut, the probability outcome will be independent from this phase. So as you can see, when you make the vertical cut, the probability remains constant. However, if in the quantum case, you, will, you can imagine this probability outcome will depending on this phase delta. So this is something we want to investigate. Um, okay, so for this B and C are still the classical case. And this is uh, uh, the measurement result for the classical case. It's fairly independent from, the, uh, from this small delta. However, to the quantum case, you will see strikingly this probability outcome will be dependent on delta for all the small phi. So this is uh, what you will expect from the quantum case. And experimentally, we got almost uh, identical to our uh, theoretical calculation. So it's uh, also behave like this phase dependence, uh, especially on the Y cut. So this is uh, uh, our experimental results. And 
showing that we witnessed the superposition of wave state and particle state of a single photo. Okay, so I will conclude my first part of my talk. So uh, with our experiments, we uh, observed the classical mixture and quantum superposition of wave and particle states. So classical mixture has, has been uh, observed before and this quantum superposition is the first time to be observed experimentally. And also with our space, uh, space time configuration, we close the locality loophole in a quantum delay choice experiment. So this uh, work has been published uh, last year in Nature Photonics. And uh, so, yeah, probably I will uh, have a pause here. And if you have any questions before I move into the second part, I would be happy to take your questions. Um, okay, if you want to ask something, uh, just raise your hand in uh, Zoom. Can I ask a question? Hello, please. Uh, Xiao Song, very nice work. Uh, I'd like to ask you, how can we uh, interpret, how can we have a physical picture of what is this, uh, inter this uh, superposition of wave and particle states in the interferometer? Because for me, if you have a, an interferometer, like a Max Zender interferometer, then if it's in the inter interferometer region, then the coherence length of the wave packet must be bigger. Therefore, the, the, you cannot, you cannot uh, understand, you cannot have a picture of where the photo is. And uh, if you know the, the photo is inside the interferometer, is because uh, the, the wave packet is, is smaller than the length, the, the, the path difference. So how can we have a picture of this superposition? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good question. So actually, um, I would like to, so one thing I didn't mention uh, during, my, uh, during my talk is, um, so typically people use uh, 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 inequality, so complementarity inequality, to characterize uh, uh, interplay between particle and wave states uh, of, a, of a photon or of a, of a quantum system. And this inequality, uh, as you probably know, uh, this famous Anglet inequality. Um, uh, in, that, uh, in that inequality, I would like to emphasize that for the classical mixture, you can also satisfy it, that inequality, meaning that if you measure the which path information and visibility, and you will find this d squared plus v squared are always less than equal to one, less than or equal to one. And this is perfect fine. So this is perfect fine even for the classical mixture state. And also it's fine for quantum superposition state. However, uh, what we show here is something people uh, didn't uh, look into before meaning that uh, this relative phase really matters and uh, uh, in some cases, and one can even directly measure that. So this is one comment I would like to uh, uh, give uh, at this point. And to answer your question, how to understand the superposition between particle and wave is that, um, so with this mixture picture, one can say in one experiment, the photon either behave as a particle or behave as a wave, which is fine. But this didn't uh, highlight the striking uh, feature of quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics tells, you, tells us that not only you can have uh, this probability distribution, you can also have uh, uh, this phase dependence. And this phase dependence mm, is important in, in some experiments, for example, our experiment, and so we can distinguish that. And um, I don't know if I answer your question, uh, if, if, if that's what you ask. Well, this issue can, can be uh, complicated, but uh, I understand that you are, you are saying that uh, maybe one way towards understanding this, this 
having a picture of, of what's going on, is trying to look at these uh, inequalities that you mentioned. Right? That, that mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe that's a, that's a good way of trying to understand this. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, Sergey Kulik. Uh, thank you very much. This is very interesting. So, could you give some details? Uh, I mean, intensity, polarization, whether. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear Just, I couldn't could hear you. you. Could, could you tell something about the three photon source? A uh, three photon source, okay. How many photons did you get? So, so the three photon source, so we didn't uh, uh, spend. Uh, so we didn't uh, uh, create a new type of source. So this is a source even goes back to uh, 95. This um, Kuyat uh, invented this uh, type two non-collinear photon uh, polarization entangled photon source. And the second source is uh, a heralded single photon source. They, uh, they are in the uh, HV polarization. So they are not entangled, but uh, they are not entangled in polarization but they are created in the same time. And therefore we can detect one photon to crowd the second photon. And for the uh, rate uh, sense, I think we get something like 200 Hertz uh, four photon rate. So here, uh, although I talked about three photon, but we have a fourth photon. This is a trigger photon. Yeah. So all in all it's about two, 200 Hertz, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, Stanislav? Yeah, I, I think I have some fundamental misunderstanding of uh, what these particle and wave states means. Uh, so we're still talking about single photon states, right? So what do they look like in, I don't know, a fog basis, for example? You have a- ah, In fog basis. Yeah, okay. so, well, in some, can you, can you like write down some explicit um, expression for this P and W? Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I mentioned that at the beginning, actually, let me go back. So, oh, okay, it's here. So this is, uh, um, for example, I didn't write it in four states, but you can uh, imagine that uh, it's possible because here uh, zero stands for mode zero, mode zero being the photon occupy this spatial mode zero. And one stands for the other spatial modes, mode one, and for the particle states from the expression, you can see the so amplitude of zero state and one state is uh, are independent from the uh, the phase. The so amplitude are independent from the phase. However, for the wave states, you can see the so amplitudes are depending on the phase. For example, here we have a sine dependence, and here we have a cosine dependence. So this is a uh, um, I would say this is a very operational definition. It's not the only definition of particle and wave. I, I have to cl clarify that, but this uh, fits very well to our experiments uh, in order to uh, clarify the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, may I also ask, uh, so uh, am I right that uh, the, uh, um, the third, uh, the third axis on your uh, color plots is uh, probability of uh, de detector D1 count. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. I so, all see... of these are, so all of this figure stands, so probably I didn't mention that, but all these figures the color plot stands for the probability of detecting photon in one of the outputs of the interferometer. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So if I see clearly there are no more questions, yeah, I think you may continue and then we will. Okay. Okay, so the second part of my talk will be uh, different. So now I switch gear to the application. And so recently we are interested in uh, realizing uh, photonic experiments uh, with chip scale uh, platform. And oh, so oh, this is- Excuse me, excuse me, I, I, I missed, uh, sorry. There were two questions in, in a chat. Uh...
Uh, okay, so the first question, uh, would the experimental result be the same if uh, instead of two labs you'd use the fiber of 100 meter long? And how fast must be EOM? Would the experimental result be the same if instead of two labs you use a fiber of 100 meter long? So I don't, I'm not sure that uh, I understand this question. Do you mean uh, one lab, but uh, uh, puts the uh, second part of the equipment also in the same lab, but use a 100 meter long fiber to connect them. Is, is that the question? Okay, so no, so, so, so the answer is no, because in our experiments, we want to have uh, uh, this space-time configurations as I, um, okay, as I, as I previously said. So if instead of using two labs, uh, we use one lab and use fiber to delay it, S, C, and A, they will be all in this lab. And if everything is in one lab, then the F, you can imagine that the future light cone of F events will definitely cover the events I. So this is, uh, if, this is exactly the thing we want to avoid. We want to have a space-like separation between I and F. And but, in order to achieve that, you need two labs. Uh, but how can, does it change the results? So it, it may change the meaning of these results, but um, the numbers which you get from your equipment. Numbers, uh, as, a, as, a, as a firm believer of uh, quantum mechanics, I don't think that will change the result. So, so the meaning of your results will change, but uh, the, mm -hmm, the experimental- The number will not change. The number will not change, yes. This is my answer. Okay, and so how fast must be the electro-optical modulator? So here we have a, a megahertz. Uh, uh, so in, in the experiment we use, I, if I remember correctly, it's 50 megahertz, something like that. With a on time, with a switch on time of uh, uh, less than two, less than two nanoseconds. I, Okay, thank you. Now I see that's all the questions. Sorry for <laughs> continue, please. Okay, so um, yeah, sorry. so uh, so uh, sorry, sorry. Just one more question, Nikolai Skrebin, please. Okay. okay. Nikolai. <clears throat> Nikolai, we didn't hear you. Not hear you. Okay, I think you, you may continue and uh, Nikolai will ask you later. Yeah, if you have uh, any other questions, feel free to ask me at the end of the talk. That's also fine. Okay, so uh, I was talking about uh, uh, that recently we also realized to generate uh, three dimensional entanglements on a silicon chip. So this is different from what I just talked now uh, because uh, I was talking about three photon entanglements, but they are, uh, these photons are encoded in polarization. So therefore, uh, the dimensionality of a single photon is, is two dimension. And now we do a uh, difference. So we extend the dimensionality to three. And uh, specifically, we use this uh, uh, entangled source to simulate graphs. And this is one of the application we realized with this chip. So uh, all of this is motivated by uh, my uh, previous colleague, uh, Anton and Mario and Xue Mei. And in 2017, they proposed a very intriguing um, theoretical proposal. Uh, that's, uh, they propose that uh, actually one can use the quantum experiments, specifically quantum photonic experiment to simulate graphs. And the tasks they propose is to use the multipartite entangled states for searching the perfect matching in a graph. And to find the number of perfect matching of a graph in computer uh, science or in the, this computational complexity theory, 
uh, it's a sharp p complete problem, meaning that even if you have a quantum computer that cannot be solved uh, uh, or it's conjectured, it cannot be solved efficiently. However, in, oh, okay. How, however, um, in their experiments, they find by using photonic experiments, one can uh, find this perfect matching efficiently. And to begin with their proposal, I would like to first mention what do you mean by, uh, what do they mean by perfect matching? So this is a term from uh, graph theory. So uh, if we give a simple example, like uh, this, this figure here, and this figure is uh, composed by four vertices and six edges. And a perfect matching meaning that's a set of edges connect each individual vertices once and only once. So if we uh, look uh, into this, uh, this graph and the perfect matching number will be three. That will be this one, red edge, because it connects A, B, C, D exactly once. Or it can be this blue one. It connects B, D, and A, C exactly once. Or the last one is this green one. So the green one also connects B, C, and A, D exactly once. So this is called perfect matching. And the number of perfect matching for this graph is three. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the background of this uh, perfect matching of a graph. And it turns out to, if you have a complicated graph, to find the number of this perfect matching is difficult. It's a sharp P complete problem. And in their paper, they proposed, actually we, one can simulate such graph with a series of photon pair sources. And here, for example, the Excuse photon me. pair. Excuse me, Shoso. Uh, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think if I don't understand this, I would, won't be able to follow. What's the difference between the three figures in C? So uh, there's uh, uh, so the difference is the edges connect different vortices are different. So the red edges connect to uh, A, B, and C, D. And this is called one perfect matching. And the second one is different from, uh, from, the, uh, from the first one. And the third one is different from uh, the first two. Is that, uh, is that what you're asking or, or, or do I, do yeah. I, do I, do I miss yeah, okay. So you don't have to care about this thing, uh, blue lines. So they, they are not important. So they are just there for illustration. What is important is this colored edge. Okay, so in their uh, paper, they realized that actually one can construct uh, a multi-photon pair sources to simulate such graph. And specifically, one can simulate such a four vortices graph with such a setup. Here, every rectangular stands for a photon pair source. And uh, at the end, you can find uh, uh, these mappings. So in graph theory, you have a graph composed by vertices and edges. And in quantum experiments, you have an optical setup with crystals. Here, crystal stands for uh, nonlinear crystal, which can generate photon pairs. And uh, in graphs, the edges can be simulated by the crystals and the vertices of the graph can be simulated by the optical path. So if you look at the uh, figure A here, so every crystal, for, for example, this five, they are one crystal and they represent an edge labeled here, this red edge. And one stands for the edge connecting A and D. So uh, if you set up this kind of mapping, at the end of the day, you will find the number of perfect matchings are corresponding to the n-fold coincidence. So that means one can measure the multi-photon coincidence counts to obtain this perfect matching. So this is a, uh, I mean, this paper is more complicated than that, but so this is the key message uh, of, uh, of this paper. So yeah, so uh, and the numbers of quantum state coherent terms are the number of perfect matching. 
So at the end of the day, what we want to do is if we can find how many terms are in this quantum state, these terms has to be coherent. The terms of in this quantum state are the numbers of the perfect matching. So if we find these coherent terms, number of coherent terms, we will find the number of perfect matchings. So this is uh, uh, the task we want to accomplish. However, as you can imagine, that's for four vertices uh, graph. It's simple, that's one can count it uh, by hand. However, it already needs a six crystal uh, uh, structure. And if you uh, keep reading their paper, even go into their supplementary information, you will find uh, a typical uh, a, uh, uh, a typical graph, which is uh, still can be calculated classically, but already have some difficulty. Will require a structure like this. So this is, uh, I would say, this is uh, a little bit difficult or or daunting task for uh, for us uh, who is used to bulk optics, and therefore we want to develop some new platforms. Uh, to uh, uh, to tackle these kind of questions, and one platform uh, we are interested in are uh, is silicon photonics. Why silicon photonics? Uh, uh, because silicon, as we know, is uh, is a working horse of uh, uh, microelectronics. It's good for electronics, but silicon is also good for optics. The reason is that the silicon has a very high refractive index. So typically for glass, we have 1.5 and for silicon, we have 3.5. So that's really high. And because, it, uh, because of its high refractive index, we can bend the waveguide sharply and still maintain the reasonable low loss. And this has been uh, studied uh, by the IBM group in the beginning of uh, 2000. So it's a very good optical material. Also, we can use uh, mature uh, fabrication technique developed in CMOS industry and use that to uh, <clears throat> use that technique to fabricate large scale reproducible uh, chip. And third, for quantum uh, photonics, silicon is also very good because uh, it's compatible to superconductors. Therefore, we can de uh, deposit these superconducting uh, nanofilms on top of this waveguide, so he's showing here is a gray slab is an optical waveguide made by silicon and the red helping like uh, 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 wires, they are uh, superconducting wires. And we can realize a device such that the photon can propagate in the waveguide and at the end of the waveguide, if we incorporate such a superconducting nanowire detectors, we can detect this photon on the same chip. And this is pioneered by a Towns group at Yale in 2012. So last but not least, uh, we like uh, silicon uh, because it also have uh, optical nonlinearities. And we all know to create correlated or even entangled photons, one needs nonlinearities. And uh, for silicon, although it does not have chi Nonlinearities uh, such as uh, like BBO, lithium niobate, but it has a strong chi 3 nonlinearities. So, in this chi 3 nonlinearity, we can um, annihilate two pound photon and generate signal and idler photons. And these two photons are also correlated in uh, several degrees of freedom. And this is uh, work pioneered by uh, a Bristol Group. So if we break down uh, the components in quantum optics experiments, we normally uh, have the following five components, including source. So with this source, we can generate photon pairs or heraldic single photons. Filter, we want to uh, reject the pump photon or unwanted uh, noise with, uh, with uh, bandpass filters. And also we need to have a circuitry. This circuitry can gener uh, can real implement the logical operations of this of single photons. And fourth, we want to have a memory because memory is important for either communication or for uh, 
enhance the multi-photon generation rate. So this memory is also very important. And last, we need to detect the photons. So with, uh, uh, with this superconducting nanowire detectors, as I mentioned earlier, we can uh, detect the single photons uh, on chip. So this is the uh, components we would like to build. And we want to do this step by step. And today I will tell you our recent uh, efforts in bringing source, filter, and circuitry, these three components onto a single chip. And this is a chip uh, we designed and uh, made. Uh, um, and this is based on silicon on oxide uh, SOI, silicon on insulator platform. And uh, we can, on this chip, we can have uh, multiple photon pair sources and uh, incorporate electrodes and wire bonnets and uh, use external uh, electrical uh, power supply to drive this chip. And this is, uh, uh, this is uh, mainly uh, finished by my postdoc, Liang Liang, Li Jun, uh, student Li Jun and Zhi Yu. And this, is, this work has also been published uh, earlier this year. So uh, before we go to detail, let's first uh, uh, brief, uh, have a, a brief overview of on-chip photon pair sources. So actually uh, the, by doing um, or by harnessing the past degrees of freedom of photon on chip, um, this idea has a long history actually, all the way goes back to uh, 2012. Anton's group uh, come, came up with this uh, uh, past degree of freedom encoding and uh, to present a scalable in terms of dimension expansion. And uh, they realized uh, the first uh, entangled source, a three dimensional entangled source with uh, partial on chip components. And in, two, uh, in 2018, Bristol's group uh, realized uh, uh, the largest uh, on chip uh, source. This is uh, uh, 16 dimensional entanglement source uh, on a single chip. So this, is, this was reported in 2018. However, in all of these experiments, they use a straight waveguide as a source. So as you can see here, there is some um, uh, black circle here, and those are meander silicon nano wires. And those wires are waveguides, they are straight. So uh, we all know that uh, by, by using uh, cavity, one can uh, enhance uh, pump waveguide interaction and hence bringing up the production rates of single photons. And this has been uh, investigated also in Bristol School. And they, in their work, uh, they, okay, they use two different sources. One is this nanowire sources, the other one is this ring resonator sources. And already in their own work, they can see a factor of 30 times larger uh, generation efficiency. And this is solely because of the resonance enhancement. However, there is a trade-off for this waveguide, uh, for this uh, resonator uh, source. The purity of these single photon pairs and the efficiency for photon pair extraction, there is always a trade-off. So you cannot have both. You cannot optimize both based on such a simple structure. In order to disentangle these two factors, one needs to independently tune the coupling rates of different modes. Here, the modes stands for, for example, the pump photon, the signal photon, and the idle photon. So ideally, you want to have a structure that can tune the coupling rate from the ring resonator to the bus waveguide independently. And this is very difficult for, especially for four wave mixing because all the wavelengths are very close to each other. Everything is close to 1550 nanometer for silicon uh, SOI uh, platform. And then uh, in 2017, um, Paul Elsing and colleagues, they proposed um, a new type of structure. They, uh, they use phase matching between the resonator and the interferometer to realize such an independent tuning. And they propose to use such a structure. So as you can see, this is uh, more complicated than this. So this is a ring resonator embedded 
in a Maxinger interferometer. So this is one arm. This is another arm. Okay, so this is a ring resonator embedded in this interferometer. Oh, okay, I see I'm over time already. So, um, so here uh, specifically, they would like to have a situation that the pump is critically coupled to the bus waveguide. And therefore, all the pump will go into this resonator and generate single photons efficiently. On the other hand, they also want to have an over coupled regime, which is here to maximize the extraction efficiency of signal and idle photon coming out from this resonator. So by having such a structure, one can realize the phase tuning and hence tune the coupling efficiency. And also by having this multiple coupling regime, regime they can uh, maximize the extraction efficiency. So that's a key point. I mean, there is some calculation behind that, but so that's a, um, just a simple understanding of, uh, of such a scheme. And here is our, uh, our device or one of our device. So we have uh, a pump input. The pump will generate single photons here. And the single photon after generation will be extracted from this drop pot. So the key is to minimize the leak of pump through uh, this through port and maximize the extraction of signal and idle photon into this drop port. And here is a, is a, a microscope optical image of this source. We have electrodes on, on top of the ring, which is tuning the phase and electrodes on the interferometer to, uh, to also tune the phase of the interferometer. And uh, so this is what we got. So before we send, uh, without any tuning, you can see there is a strong pump leakage here. And with thermal tuning, one can eliminate this uh, leakage and only allow signal and either coming out from this drop pot. And if we send, uh, for, uh, send probe light into this input port, one can also see what well, we enhanced the extinction ratio. So all of these are transmission measurements. So we send photon from input port and measure from the through port. So if we do this, we will see a pump a dip here. Not too bad, but we can do better than that with tuning. And with tuning, one can see everything is going down by almost 15 dB. And we, in the same time, we also eliminate the leakage of signal and idler in this port. And if we measure the coincidence counts, uh, so we measured rates uh, at the, so if you look at the x-axis, here is the power of the pump. The power of the pump is only like 250 microwatt. And we measure, so this is what we measured. The measure number is about 600 Hertz. And the inferred rate, so the generation rates on chip is about three megahertz. So this is uh, exceeds all the uh, bulk optical uh, uh, generation count rate. And also we have a, a, a very good coincidence efficiency, namely at the low pump power regime, we can generate, we can obtain almost 97% efficiency, meaning that all the signal and idler photon coming out from this drop port, not going to through or at. So with this type of source, we managed to have a high generation efficiency and also reduce off-chip filtering and have a high extraction efficiency in the same time. And this is a, uh, this is a, a layout of, our, our, of the whole chip. So we use this chip to generate a three-dimensional entangled photon source. And by, in order to do that, we have a three identical source source three, source two, source one. And from them, we can generate photon pairs. And these photon pairs will be uh, splitted by this uh, on-chip wavelength demultiplexer. And so the long wavelength photon will go here and short wavelength photon will go here. And so we use this multiport to manipulate their quantum states. And the quantum states uh, generated from this source can be written as 0, 0, plus 1, 1, and plus 2, 2. By tuning the splitting ratio of the pump and the phase between them, we can also adjust the amplitude in front of these three terms. 
And uh, so this is a, a microscope image of, uh, of our chip. You can see there are three sources here, three this green interferometer source here, WDM here, and here are the uh, phase shifters. So, okay, I will skip this because this is technical details. Later on, if you are interested, I can, can show you again. So with this source, because of the spatial modes are all overlapped very well. So we can generate high quality uh, mod, uh, entangled uh, photon source. So first we generate a two dimensional entangled source. So this is a typical Bell states, zero, zero plus one, one. And we get something like 97% fidelity and also one, one plus two, two. And by having these two uh, two dimensional maximal entangled states, we generate the three dimensional entangled state. And here we also get something like 95% uh, fidelity. So having this source at hand, then we go uh, into uh, the simulation of graphs. So uh, in our work, we uh, take the baby step of this simulation. Namely, we simulate a, a three dimensional entangled states. So this, uh, since we only have two passes, and this is, stands for two volt vortices. However, we have a three dimensional system. So the edge connects these two uh, vortices will be three. And each of the individual connection stands for one perfect connection. So with this, we can uh, measure perfect mesh number equaling to three. And this is our results in uh, measured in computational basis. And this is uh, raw count rates. And one can see only the, uh, the combination and um, it should show maximum uh, counts. And this is uh, zero, zero correlation, one, one correlation and two, two correlations. And all the other cross correlations are zero. So this is what we should get. So this corresponds to the three terms. But also we need to confirm that uh, these terms are coherent superimposed with each other. Meaning that we have to measure the correlation in all bases. And this is our result. So we measured in uh, bases uh, two, three, and four. And one can see in the diagonal uh, axis, we all get maximum uh, numbers. And this is what you should get. It's about uh, uh, 33%, so uh, one third. And if we summarize uh, all four bases, we all get uh, um, good correlations in all three bases, uh, in all four bases in this three dimensional Hilbert space. So in addition to that, uh, in addition to the simulation, we also measured, uh, use these states, use these three dimensional entangled states to do some quantum metrology experiment. By changing the phase PZ1 and PZ2, then we probe the coincidence. This is what we get. So by scanning the two phases, we measure the coincidence and we will get such a curve. And this is a coincidence between port one and port two. And moreover, we can measure port one, port four, and port one, port six. They are complement to each other. But they are complement in a high dimensional, uh, high dimensional space. So if you plot all this white curve, white cut, and you will get something like this. And uh, for metrology, one parameter is very important. Uh, this is the sensitivity. This sensitivity, uh, a parameter is defined as a derivative between coincidence over phase change. So this corresponds to the slope of these curves. And for two pass uh, interferometry, this sensitivity value equals to 0 0.5. And for three pass classical interferometer, it corresponds to 0 0.78 per radian. And because we use this uh, maximally entangled states, we can obtain this sensitivity value 1.4 uh, per radian. So this is uh, um, doubled the classical value uh, one can have. So this is also shows the uh, advantage of using uh, high dimensional entangled states. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. So I showed you two things. One is this fundamental experiment showing the quantum wave particle superposition. And the second thing is uh, 
showing you uh, using uh, silicon photonics to uh, generate three-dimensional quantum entanglement and its application. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, have a question. Ah, there is a question in the chat. Ah, okay, Paolo, maybe you first. Thank you. Show some. Thank you very much. Very nice uh, talk. Uh, it was a, a bit uh, fast in the end. So I have some. Uh, <laughs> too much time. Some, uh, sure. some uh, questions, like, uh, for instance, this three dimensional state that you produce, uh, what's the meaning of this, this uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 2? This, this is a uh, mm -hmm. photon generator in crystal 1, 2, and 3. And, uh, and that, uh, another, yeah, another question related to the graph the structure. Uh, could you please move forward? Move a few slides. One more. more one more. Uh, yes, this one, this one. So in, in this is the previous one. Yes, in this one. Red, uh, green, and blue uh, crystals. This uh, line is going through the crystals. What does this mean? Uh, what does this mean physically? Is the for instance, signal beam going through uh, the signal path of all others and so on. So these are the, the two questions. Okay. Okay. So the uh, so I think these two questions are uh, are uh, related. So first of all, this uh, zero zero one one two two, they are stands for the path, the path the photon took. So for example, we label this small path as zero. The next one is one, the, the, uh, the last one is two, and same for the blue photon. If zero, zero, that means this fault, uh, the photon, if we detect one photon in path zero for the red photon, then we will have a high probability to detect the other photon, the blue photon also in path zero. And so as you so correctly- I always correct. two photons. Uh, uh, only a photon pair. O only a photon pair, yes. Photon pair. So this is a this is a two photon experiment. Okay, so uh, so this stands for the path, and uh, so it's probably it's good that I explain here. Um, so we have this small path zero one two, and also we have a big path. So we we call it big path. Big paths are the paths the red photon took. So all these three uh, small paths composed of one big path. And same for this one. So we have two big paths and th six small paths. And if you look at the graph, so this black arrow you asked is, is a big path. This is a big path. So all in all, since we only have two photon experiments, we will only have two passes. And therefore the vortices in the graph, the vortices, the number of the vortices in the graph is two. So I don't know if I, uh, yeah. So I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, okay, I understood, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, Stanislav, you may ask directly a question, I think. I'm, I'm really w w wondering uh, about what do you mean by efficiently solving this uh, perfect matching problem? Mm -hmm. Did I heard you correctly? So what do you mean by efficiently? Because it's since it's a sharply complete problem then. Yeah, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. So we don't talk about, uh, we don't talk about uh, in polynomial time because we are, so for us, the time you will spend on computation is the propagation time of photon in your circuit. So that's uh, that's the first thing. And second thing, efficiency meaning the number of uh, overheads, the components. So it's polynomial. The number of components is polynomial. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, but this is a tricky question because you want to, if you want to say polynomial, you want to give a, a accuracy of your of your measurement uh, re re results, right? That's a polynomial to what extent? So uh, I have to be honest and answer you that. That's uh, so far for this problem, we haven't looked into the uh, accuracy. So if you have a computational task, you have to give a error probability and uh, the amount of time to solve this uh, task within this error uh, probability. So, um, so far there's no error model uh, proposed for this question. However, if you, if you don't think about that, if you don't consider about the error probability and only look at the components, overhead components, that's a polynomial. But I mean, if we take boson sampling, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, it, you cannot use boson sampling to calculate permanence, for example, which is also a short mm -hmm. complete problem. You can or cannot? You cannot. You cannot, uh, okay. Yeah. It, it is hard because permanents are involved, but you cannot use a boson sampler to calculate permanence because you have to, to, to acquire the uh, value of a permanent of a matrix uh, with a desired precision. Uh, you have to- Yes, so that's what I accumulate mentioned. Accumulate statistics, and these statistics yes. will be exponential in the accuracy you desire. So you-, you, yes. you your the number of coincidences you require will be exponential in uh, in something, for example. In, in... So I agree with you. So uh, bottom sampling in that sense, it's uh, so that's only one one of the problems for bottom sampling. So you have to uh, claim that in such in uh, 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 arrow range that this bottom sampling is correct. So what I'm saying is for this problem people are not as advanced as bottom sampling. So we are not looking into this arrow range yet, but so, but you are right. So this is certainly one of the things one should think about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Any more questions, please? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Ranjit, please. <clears throat> So uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, do you study diffraction properties of light propagating in SiO2? Can you say it again? Uh, uh, dif diffraction. So do you study diffract diffraction? Yes. Diffraction. Diffraction. Uh, diffraction. Uh, okay. Diffraction in, in what? In waveguides or? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, in waveguides. So, uh, so we, in this type of experiment, we don't consider that. However, uh, diffraction is important when you consider the photon loss. So at the beginning, I talked about this, um, the advantage of silicon. Uh, this is due to the large uh, refractive index. So for example, if you, can, uh, if, you, uh, um, if you can see this curve. However, it's not 100% uh, perfect. As you can see, when you reduce the, uh, the radius of the bending from five micrometers, so the blue curve here is uh, five micrometer and green is two micron and red is one micron. So when you reduce the uh, radius, you will see loss kicks in. And the reason this loss kicks in is due to the uh, sort of diffraction, diffraction in the waveguides. So this is uh, uh, what we call the radiation loss. So uh, you are right that uh, this diffraction phenomena also exists in waveguides, and uh, if you don't control it properly, this diffraction will kill you. However, in our design, we uh, keep our radius to be about uh, 10 to 15 micro. So this is uh, much larger than uh, the, the number showing here. So in that range, diffraction is quite small, and we normally ignore them. Okay. The sec second one is, if I understood correctly, you are using uh, SiO2 or QAS. So 
in uh, and using uh, yeah. non-linear non-linearity uh, chi three. So so it means that you are using uh, cross uh, face modeling and uh, self face uh, modulation. Uh, so, uh, am I right? Uh, so, uh, in these experiments, uh, so there are a lot of chi three uh, uh, non uh, nonlinear effects, and in these experiments, we use this spontaneous four wave mixing. In this process, when you have inject two pump photon, which is uh, purple arrows here, and these two pump photon will annihilate and generate one blue signal photon and one red idle photon. Mm -hmm. And this process conserves energy and uh, momentum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, also I have one question. So in uh, this experiment, it's very, uh, it's very important to, uh, to get a photon indistinguishability from different sources. So mm -hmm. you explain how did you turn it? Uh, I mean, spectral uh, properties or maybe other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this question uh, is not a rehearsal <laughs> for the rest of the audience because this is exactly the slides I skipped. So, <clears throat> so this is not, uh, so although I talked about a lot of advantage of, uh, of using this on-chip uh, source, but as you as you correctly said, uh, to make them indistinguishable is one of the uh, one of the biggest challenges, I would say. And uh, as you can see here, here plots uh, two photon interference visibility as a function of the frequency detuning between different sources. So here stands for source three, and this is at detuning zero. This is source one. So in experiments, we change the uh, the applied power, the electrical power on the phase shifter on uh, source three and sweep it across source one. It's a good point. So if they are all uh, have d zero detuning, they will give us uh, maximally uh, two photon interference, which is here. And same, we have to do uh, source three and source two. So only by doing this, we can make sure that uh, these two sources are uh, identical to each other, and therefore we can have uh, uh, this good uh, fidelity results. So you just uh, tune uh, different uh, cavities uh, by uh, thermal optical effect, yeah? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so if I see there are no questions in, ch ah, in chat mm -hmm. and in... Uh, uh, can I ask one question more? Uh, okay, one I'm more, sorry. and we uh, and we should uh, close. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you. Uh, so, uh, do you use polarization uh, of the photon in your experiments? Because uh, I uh, yeah. did not hear. So the first experiment so we use polarization, and the second experiment we use only pass encoding, because all the polarization on the waveguides they are the same. So all mm -hmm. the photons position here on the waveguides are the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you use a different polarization, do you see different picture or different output results? Or, or maybe uh, polarization may increase uh, some efficiency or something else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you comment? So, yeah, so, uh, so yes, and by using, uh, by using polarization and together with the pass, we can in enhance, further increase the dimensionality. However, for those waveguides, it's difficult to control uh, polarization in the waveguides. And uh, the reason is uh, the refractive index between two polarizations are huge. So this is very different from uh, fiber or uh, or uh, this uh, glass-based uh, uh, photonic chips. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, because uh, a, a simple explanation is the geometry. So the waveguides here are all rectangular. And in fiber or PLC uh, or laser writing PLC, especially 
the waveguide's cross section is circular, so therefore they, you have degeneracy. And here we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. So I think we, we are in time now and we need to finalize our seminar. So thank you again for the very interesting uh, thank you talk. So much. Okay, and you're welcome. I'm glad. So see thank you, you all very next. Nice. Okay, thank see you all Paul. next week at our next seminar. Okay, see you. See you. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, uh, Ivan, you have a question? Uh, I, I don't hear you. Uh, yeah, now. Uh, um. There is no one to answer the question, I believe. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's... So, see you oh, guys. So you may ask him on you by email. Okay, <laughs> see you. Yeah.